For the next 15 minutes, imagine that you could no longer use your phone. You don't have Wi-Fi, SMS, or calling capability. On the back of your lanyard behind your schedule, you should have either a red or a blue card. First, I ask the people with the red cards to hold their card up. And while they're doing that, for the people with the blue cards to hold their card up. Look around. Roughly two-sevenths of you have red cards. Red means that you're connected, that you have regular, unhindered access to technology. Well, blue means that you don't. You have just experienced the digital divide. You can put your cards back in. A few years ago, people filled the streets during the Occupy movement, protesting the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. But if you're online, the notion of a digital divide is more invisible. Because if you have regular access to the internet, you have no idea about the have-nots, the people who have never been online. It's a different kind of poverty, not just a lack of money, but a lack of information, a lack of communication. But let's go back to the cards for a second and put that information in context. As of this year, 2.08 billion people are smartphone users. That's two-sevenths of the world's population. What about the other five billion? They don't even have access to basic technology. The digital divide is defined as the gap between people who have access to technology and those who don't. When I say technology, I mean information and communication technologies, like telephone lines or wireless signals. Phones and laptops are the most common. But when we think about the digital divide, it also deals with issues and technologies and devices used in different fields, like medicine, or aerospace engineering, or education. The digital divide is a serious issue that we face in the world today. But this definition doesn't scratch the surface of the issue because the gap isn't so much about access to technology, it's about the benefits that are derived from that access. The world is so incredibly connected, yet some countries aren't connected at all. Take a look at this data visualization by Gregor Eich, a graphics editor at the New York Times. Notice that in Europe, there are many people and many IP addresses. In North America, there is still a high ratio of IP addresses to people. But then look at parts of Africa, most of India, and much of Southeast Asia. In these places, there are many people, but relatively few IP addresses. According to Aisha's website, this map shows over 80,000 populated places in blue. And while this map doesn't take into account the use of mobile phones to access the internet, it gives us a good idea of how deep the digital divide really is. It doesn't seem right to characterize it as just a gap. It's more a chasm. Yes, it is different to know you have a phone and to never be able to use it again than to never have had a phone at all. But consider how difficult it is for us to live without our laptops or our phones. And I'm not trying to say that we're too dependent on technology. I'm saying the opposite. That there are too many people in the world who don't have access to even basic technology. And even if they do, their education seldom allows them to use it effectively. In contrast, our work, our education is often centered around technology. I am a geek girl. 
I love everything numbers related. I'm a programmer on the robotics team. And my favorite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Technology is so deeply entwined in my life that I found it inconceivable that there were five billion people in the world that didn't have access to basic technology. So, as my Girl Scouts Gold Award project and as a Global Issues Network, or GIN, action project, I went head to head with a global issue. I knew that the digital divide existed, but I didn't have a name for it until I joined the GIN Club, the Global Issues Network Club, in my freshman year at SAS. It was through the club that I learned more about global issues, in particular the digital divide, and also gained more confidence in myself. I realized that I could bring about concrete change if I learned to think globally and act locally. I started the Digital Divide Committee in my sophomore year, just after I had been elected a vice president. Every Tuesday, we met and continue to meet to discuss possible solutions to the digital divide. And one day, I had an idea to create a curriculum for a basic computer skills class. This idea matured into a full-fledged GIN action project and later my Girl Scouts Gold Award. Even in high-tech cities like the one we're living in now, you don't have to look very far to see a digital divide. In Singapore, there are many domestic helpers who are at a disadvantage because of financial reasons. And often, they have limited skills outside of housework which puts them at a disadvantage if they were for any reason to lose their jobs. Inspiration struck. I'd watched my helper, Ima, attend a computer class every weekend for the past year. Organizations that help domestic helpers exist, like the school Ima was going to, but classes at these schools are expensive. They're about $70, which is 10% of a helper's average income. So I thought that teaching my curriculum to helpers in my neighborhood would be a great start and a win-win. Because it was a free class, and I could get immediate feedback on my curriculum and teaching style. One Saturday, I worked with my own helper and two of my neighbors and taught them the skills that we had outlined in our curriculum. One helper named Cherry gave me honest and helpful feedback that I implemented in future presentations. She told me to talk slower, to be more engaging, and to create more detailed slides. Also, the project, I got a lot of suggestions about for the project from a local Girl Scouts troop, Troop 63, who gave me ideas for possible activities I could do with my students once I was done teaching. And the project was presented as a workshop at the Global Issues Network Conference in Bali last year. In the end, the project was implemented here in Singapore, and the curriculum was taught at underprivileged schools in Bangalore, India, and Salat Mie, Indonesia. I hoped that by implementing the curriculum at school, I could empower students, that in the future, these students would be able to earn a living through the skills I had taught them. Last summer, I went to India, to Bangalore, and taught 80 high school students the basics of typing, Microsoft Office, and internet safety in two days. The school I taught at, Presidency Church School, is supported by a nonprofit organization called Petra Education Trust. This nonprofit supports close to 60 schools in Bangalore, and their students all come from lower income backgrounds, right at or below the poverty line. Here's a fun fact. When I asked them how many of them had computers at home, only a couple of my students raised their hands. But when I asked them about Facebook, nearly all of them had accounts. This just goes to show that the digital divide manifests itself in different ways. In Singapore and in places on this side of the divide, we enjoy reliable power, fast internet, and a strong infrastructure. But on countries on the other side of the divide, there are physical barriers other than just a lack of money that hinder people's access to technology. When I lived in India, there were planned power cuts because there wasn't enough energy to power the entire city. 
they had to rotate it between neighborhoods. And I was reminded of this when I went back last summer. The power went out, and as two students ran to get a backup generator, I was left wondering what the bigger implications of such an issue were. Every time the power went out, did they lose valuable class time? Did they miss important lessons? <coughs> While I was waiting for the power to come back on, I sat down with the kids, and I asked them what their dream jobs were. I told them I wanted to become a computer scientist because CS is such an amazing field. It can be used in conjunction with many others. A girl named Rizwana told me that she wanted to become a software engineer. She'd already learned Microsoft Office, and now she wanted to start programming. I told her it was a great idea. After all, only 18% of all computer science degrees are earned by women. And she was living in Bangalore, a city that is quickly shaping up to be India's Silicon Valley. With a background in CS or software engineering, Rizwana could land a well-paying job and find a sure way out of the poverty cycle. After the power came back on and after I'd finished my presentation, I split the kids up into groups and gave them a task. They could choose to work with Microsoft Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. I encouraged them to play around with different fonts, sizes, colors. If they were working with PowerPoint, I told them to try different slide transitions or animations. If they were working with Excel, I challenged them to create a graph. As the kids were working, I passed around a sheet of paper asking for feedback. One boy named Nabeen wrote that he'd like to write a company report, which was thrilling because I'd only been there a few hours and these kids were already thinking about the practical applications for what I was teaching them. I knew that giving these kids access to technology and, more importantly, education so that they could use it effectively was extremely significant. With greater access to communication technology comes more avenues for these people to express themselves, for their voices to be heard. One girl named Aishwarya was so taken by the sheer possibility that Microsoft Word offered that the school's headmaster later told me she started to write stories, that she would become an author one day. It makes me happy to say that Bangalore wasn't the only place that the curriculum was implemented. Last October, it was taken to the Indonesian island of Salatmie and taught to teachers at an elementary school. This no doubt helped the project's sustainability because these teachers could be instructing their students for generations to come. In addition, they were provided with refurbished computers and a computer lab was set up which greatly increased their access to technology. I'm glad that we were able to close the gap a little, no matter how our small our contributions seemed to be. When we think about solving global issues, we tend to place focus on one thing, improving humanity, save for the issues that deal directly with biodiversity or the environment, we find that we're placing importance on improving the human experience. Poverty eradication, education for all, peace and security, human rights. And with solving the digital divide, this is no different. Even here in Singapore with the students I was working with in the digital divide committee, I was forming relationships. And I'm proud to say that these students are maturing or have already matured into future leaders. And it was the face-to-face -face interactions that made it meaningful. With the kids in India, with the teachers in Indonesia, with the helpers here in Singapore. I was able to see firsthand the effects of what I was doing. My helper, Ima, bought a new computer with her savings. The school's headmaster in India told me that these kids are starting to use Microsoft Excel to keep track of their finances, something I'm doing right now in my personal finance class. And I'm not worried about what will happen to the Digital Divide Committee once I graduate and leave SAS. 
everyone involved is dedicated to creating continuous change. And I know that the club and the committee is in good hands. Plus, it doesn't end with me here in Singapore. I plan to bring the curriculum to college. And I'll create my own digital divide committee there and continue solving this issue. So what happens when the gap closes? Closing the digital divide does wonders for a country's development. It can provide them with state-of-the-art medical technology so that they can improve their health care. It can make governments more efficient. It can promote healthier economies. And education? It's an equalizer. Equal access to education can help alleviate gender discrimination because it provides women with more opportunities to progress themselves in lines of work normally dominated by men, just like we saw with Rizwana. So, I taught 80 students in two days. Let's say that number kept growing, that we expanded my curriculum into 10 different ones, that we gathered a group of a hundred other interested teachers, we could teach 80,000 students. Dividing that 80,000 by the five billion I spoke about at the beginning, we get one over 6,250, which means that if this was repeated just 6,250 times, we could close the gap. There are what? A hundred people in the audience right now? How would you like to be an instrumental part of solving a global issue? To count to 6,250 would take you an hour. In an hour, you could educate 10 kids. With your persistence, dedication, and hard work, we could close the digital divide. Thank you.